In this video, we're gonna talk about how do you prove that A is a subset of B by a method that's called element chasing. And I'm gonna to stick to doing direct proofs with this element chasing method. So here's the strategy. So the first step, let X be an element of A. And what does this do? So that tells us what does A look like? And you might be wondering, why is that important? That gives you something to write down. So we've got the condition that X satisfies to be an element of A, and that's something that I can write down and I can start playing with. And I want to try to think about, can I manipulate that in order to um, say something about how X is even related to B? And that's really the gist of step two, is to try to use that information about X to show that X satisfies whatever the defining conditions are for the set B. So let's look at a couple examples about how to do this. So in my first example, I've got two sets A and B. If we look at A, it says that A is the set of all integers such that X is equal to eight times K for some integer K. So A is the multiples of eight, and B is the set of all integers Y, for which Y is equal to four times L for some integer L. And you guessed it, B is the multiples of four. And I wanna prove that A is a subset of B. So not anything too crazy, just trying to show and uh, you know, formally that all the multiples of eight are in fact multiples of four as well. Not hard to believe. But let's try to put these little two steps to work here. And by the way, it was easy for me to write down this two-step strategy, but sometimes you need more help. So sometimes it's not easy to go from step one to step two. And in that case, maybe you need a different proof technique than a direct proof. Maybe you've heard of techniques like contrapositive or proof by contradiction. Again, I'm just focusing on um, illustrating this method with a direct proof. Okay, back to this one. So here's the proof, and just like we said we'd start, let X be an element of A. And what that allows me to do is to get a form down for what X looks like. So what do I know X looks like then? It's a multiple of eight. So by the definition above, that means there exists some integer K such that X is equal to eight times K. Remember now the goal is to try to use that information in order to show that X is really a multiple of four. And in symbols, you're trying to say that X is equal to four times L for some integer L. So how are we gonna mess with this? Well, I've got this expression, 8K, that's what X is, and I just wanna to try to make a four show up somehow, so I'll just factor eight as four times two, and then I'll use the associative property uh, in order to regroup some things. So I could rewrite X as four times 2K. And what you notice is 2K there in parentheses, that's an integer, so that's the L that we're looking for. Now, I don't really care what L is in this problem. You know, the problem doesn't say find L. You're just trying to convince somebody that there is an integer for which four times that integer is X, and we found it. So that's all we care about. So since 2K is an integer, we've shown that X is in B. And so what else is going on here? When I wrote down let X be an element of A, I didn't tell you that, you know, X was um, some specific element of A. All I knew was just generally, what do all the elements look like? And from that really vague information, we are able to conclude that X had to be in B. And so the logic there is that all the elements of A should be elements of B, right? There wasn't anything special about the element we picked. In other words, we'd say it was an arbitrary element, and we've shown that it's an element of B. So then that is, um, again, the logic there tells me that A is a subset of B. So that's our first example. Let's look at a more complicated one, where maybe you have to dig a little bit for like, what are the conditions again uh, that even define these two sets? So I'm being a little bit lazy here when I write down that A is just the set of differentiable functions at zero, and B is the set of continuous functions at x equals zero. And I wanna do the same thing, prove that A is a subset of B. And here is the proof, here's how it starts. We wanna keep that strategy in mind, so part one, let F be an element of A, right? Where do we start at? And again, the goal here is to try to conclude F is an element of B. And if we can do that, then we win the game. Okay, so F's an element of A, and now I've got to think about what can I say about F? And I look up at A, and it says that, well, it's a differentiable function at zero. And I've got to think about what's the definition of the derivative of a function. And so I'll pick this one. That means that F prime of zero is the limit as h goes to zero of that difference quotient, f of zero plus h minus f of zero, all divided by h. And the point is, is that that limit is a real number, and we denote that real number by f prime of zero. So that limit exists, it's a real number, and it's f prime of zero. 
And now what we want to do is we want to try to show that the function's continuous at x equals 0. And we need to remember, like, what's the symbolic definition of being continuous? And another one I'll write down here is that the limit as h goes to 0 of f of h ought to just be the output of the function at 0. And that's kind of in symbols, that idea that, you know, you're not picking up your pencil when you're around 0 there. Okay, so how do we make the jump from the green to the orange? And sometimes what you might do is you might play with, you might rearrange the expression that's orange there and try to make the green show up, if that makes sense. In other words, start with an expression that is equivalent to uh, what you have that you have to prove and to try to try to get your hypothesis worked in there somehow. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to consider, you know, what if I moved f of 0 to the other side? So I'm going to play with this expression here. And notice, I'm not claiming that it equals 0, right? What I'm going to try to show is that it equals 0. If I wrote down it equals 0 now, then I'd be, you know, um, assuming what I'm trying to prove here. So we're going to play with this thing. So if we consider this limit of f of h minus f of 0, uh, what we're going to do is a mathematician's favorite trick, or at least one of them anyway, which is to uh, multiply and divide by the same number h. Maybe you're worried here, like, well, how do you know h isn't 0? Um, because if h was 0, that'd be terrible, because you're dividing by 0. We're taking the limit as h goes to 0, though. And uh, remember, the idea with that limit there is that I'm not ever assuming that h is actually equal to that value that it's getting close to, right? I'm assuming that h is just a number that is incredibly close to 0. So I'm trying to say you shouldn't lose any sleep. We are not dividing by 0 here. But uh, what's going on? Why did I do that? Well, I'm going to color it in the next step. You see then, when I recolor these things, that there is my hypothesis. There is the limit and the definition of, my, uh, uh, of the derivative of the function. And what is really the hypothesis here? The hypothesis is that I can say something about that green, that green, well, really, it's like a sea green, uh, that greenish limit. So here is where I'm going to invoke the hypothesis. Maybe there's one more step here where I'm going to split this up as the limit of the green times the limit as h goes to 0 of h. And finally, I invoke my hypothesis here that that green limit is the number f prime of 0. And here, you know, I'm using my limit laws, right? That when I've got the limit of two functions um, that I know exist, and I'm, they're multiplied, then uh, you can split it up and multiply later. So here is where now I'm going to take the limit of each one, and I get f prime of 0 times 0 which of course is just zero. So let's recap. Again, in the very beginning, I didn't assume when I moved, I essentially moved f of zero to the left side of what I wanted to show in the beginning, but I didn't assume it was equal to zero right off the bat. We've gone through these steps to prove that it has to equal to zero, and that's important. So we've shown that, just like I said, we've proved that that limit of f of h minus f of zero is zero. Now what we can do is rearrange it so that f of zero is on the side by itself. And thus, again, we've established that idea that as h goes to zero, the um, output should uh, get close to f of zero. And so that concludes that f is in b. Remember, that means f is a continuous function. And uh, what we recovered then is that all differentiable functions uh, at zero are continuous at zero as well.